the Cranberry Country Chamber. Uh, I'm, I'm sorry, got a recording in progress. Got it, okay. <laughs> I'm Valerie Glenn, the president of the Cranberry Country Chamber of Commerce. Pam Dezura is our admin and marketing person and also the one who knows her way around the uh, Zoom calls and she's handling the, uh, the call today. Um, and Itamar uh, Khalif, thank you, Rockland Trust. Um, from Rockland Trust, Itamar has uh, never failed to give us interesting topics every month, as well as very incredible speakers, uh, remarkable speakers, and professional speakers. So uh, this is, thank you, uh, Lynn, for coming today, Lynn Marlor. And uh, just a little bit, uh, Itamar, did you have something you wanted to um you usually you have a, a, a little joke or something that you'd like no, to. I'm, I'm not prepared, sorry. Oh, <laughs> okay. <laughs> More than one day is today. <laughs> so thank you, Itamar. I also on our board of directors. Um, does a great okay. job. At, Lynn, um, thank you for coming. I'm looking forward to hearing you. Yeah. Well, great. Thank you. So uh, Lynn, uh, just a, a little bit about Lynn. She's a frequent global speaker on financial topics. Her role is co-founder of Yield Up and her work with FinTech Women, uh, NEAFP and Boston Blockchain Association. Um, Lynn is the CEO and founder of TSLLC, a consulting firm that specializes in three strategic areas, helping women entrepreneurs achieve financial independence by creating a strategy around branding, valuations, and scaling their business, helping financial institutions navigate conversions, mergers, and acquisitions, and transformation into blockchain, crypto, and digital assets. I don't know what I just said. Um, working with startups to launch creative and successful ideas. Um, Lynn, take it away, and thank you for coming today to, um, to give us some insight. Well, other than the um, the mess up with the the email this morning, or the so apologies, but um, <clears throat> so thank you very much. So I, you know, um, I want to set the stage a little bit. I've been in financial services over thirty five years, most recently uh, on Wall Street, which you know um, is a big street. But um, it, you know, my background in financial services uh, drove me to kind of explore this. I was um, head of what's called the specialized industry group, which include a lot of asset managers and corporate clients. And my asset management client, private equity hedge funds were asking me about blockchain. And I had no idea what they were talking about. So I went to my boss and I said, I need to understand this technology. Um, that was in 2018. I took a course, uh, at Oxford and, uh, my, you know, I gotta say it just, uh, you know, I, I am now down, as they say, the rabbit hole. Um, I've been involved in the technology in, say, Bitcoin since 2018. Um, I am chair of the Boston Blockchain Association because I believe that education is the way because there are so many people, companies, et cetera, who, who don't understand the differences between blockchain and Bitcoin. And uh, we're going to try to straighten all that out. I am going to say a couple of things, and that is this moves fast. Um, it is just par for the course because this technology and the digital assets associated with it are moving fast. So I'm going to try to look at everybody's face if I can while I present. And if you look like you're totally lost, um, I'll try to slow down. But there's a lot to cover and I want to really get as much out as I can. And the other thing I want to leave you with is please get educated. It is the only thing you can do. The original intent and in concept behind, you know, blockchain technology is, you know, math, money, freedom. And you see where the money is going today. Those organizations that have money are investing in these digital assets and this technology. Don't miss out for yourself and your company. That's my last message. This is not investment advice. This is entertainment, I guess. So uh, I'm gonna move on and uh, if I could share my screen, I will bring up my presentation. Let's see if Pam. <clears throat> so are you, uh, can I uh, share yeah. my screen? Yeah, Pam is, um, let's see. Okay, so you don't want to see that. Wait a minute. You should be able to. Valerie, can you just check and see? Yeah, I'm not that sure. Is you've that allowed working? it because you started it. Yeah. All right, so you hit share screen. Yeah, can you see that? Multiple and, participants. Well, it's checked, yeah. 
So what else can I do? Okay, so let me do this. Make sure that I am. Right, wait a minute. So it's. Um, Let's try that. Does that work? Yeah, just a second. Let me pull up my. Um, this should just give me a minute. Should work. You guys Valerie, see that? You can keep holding it. You got to share. Yeah, can you see that? Nope. You know what? I'm going to bow out. Wait a minute. I'm going to, uh, I think, I, here we go. Sorry. Okay. <laughs> you should be able to see this, right? Mm -hmm. Yes, we can. <clears throat> All right. Let me just make this a big screen for you. There we go. Okay, so we're going to talk a little bit about the world of digital assets, cryptocurrency, but we're also going to talk about blockchain because that is the technology behind um, behind some of these assets. Um, that's me. So let's talk about what is blockchain. And I really do want to stress the difference between blockchain and, as they say, Bitcoin, right? So blockchain, and I'm going to repeat this several times so that hopefully we start getting that, but it's a immutable ledger. So it is the ability to facilitate recording transactions that are trackable time stamped in a network and uh, virtually anything of value can be tracked and traded on a blockchain network it is that we're going to talk about crypto um we're going to talk about encryption and cryptography and all of those things the benefit of the blockchain technology and it's very important that you think about it as technology. I often refer to blockchain as distributed ledger technology. It is, as I call it, the highway that the new cars are going to drive on. The new cars being digital assets and other platforms. You could also describe it as, you know, blockchain is um, <clears throat> the plumbing in the house, right? It is the way things move and transactions um, are tracked. Digital assets, on the other hand, are a medium of exchange, which is typically uh, thought of as money, right, value. Uh, they are stored electronically on the blockchain, and there is encryption and cryptography techniques that are controlling that. Bitcoin is probably the best example of a digital asset. All right, I always, oops, sorry, I've got my screen down here. So, <clears throat> Again, just to reiterate, blockchain is a chain of blocks time stamped across a lot of computers. It's more secure than a centralized platform. And when I talk centralized platform, we're gonna get into that in a minute. That's what most of us have grown up with. Uh, essentially, it's like databases with uh, identical copies. The benefit is that if I don't know you or I don't trust you because I don't know you, right? It creates trust, which is something that we lost in 2008, certainly in the financial uh, world. So let's look at, um, you know, let's look a little deeper. Oops, sorry, I'm rushing ahead here. Let's look a little deeper into blockchain and the technology behind it, All right? This is really what it looks like in the, um, <clears throat> in the database, if that's what you can, want to call it. Transactions are recorded in blocks. So it could be, I'm selling you my house. It includes the refrigerator, the curtains, da, 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 whatever that is, all right? Every time my house... I sell it to Valerie, Valerie says it's to Itamar, Itamar sells it to Pam. Every single transaction along the way, my original transaction goes with that transaction to the end person. Everybody sees what is in that transaction, okay? Each block has a signature of the previous block and they're linked together in a chain. Um, they are distribu distributed in a decentralized way. So no more, you know, registry of deeds has the information. No more, my bank has the information of where the money is, all right? It is a new way to store and exchange information. Many people call it the next generation of the internet, okay? So here I've said a magic number. Every single transaction has, just like you would see in a financial institution, you know, a transaction number. So there are numbers that are associated with this in characters. And um, we'll talk about hashes and Merkle roots. That stuff is very technological. I'm not gonna get into that today because I think what I wanna do is just give you how is it, you know, the reality of this technology and how we're seeing it being used. So 
uh, we'll get into a little more. So how does it work? So if I want to request a, a transaction, I want to buy some shirts from Indonesia, all right? Um, I could request a transaction in a blockchain environment, right? In a supply chain environment, I send it to somebody who's manufacturing shirts in Indonesia. I am using a peer-to-peer -peer network, and I'm sure you've heard of that. Peer-to-peer -peer networks do not travel on the traditional bank rails. So when I'm talking about a payment, I want to buy these shirts, but I need to exchange that for a, a value, whether that's dollars or if it's Indonesia, their Indonesian lira, whatever the currency might be, right? That, this is in a peer-to-peer -peer network. I've taken out the banks. I don't go to my bank and say, hey, I need to send $5,000 here. And they send it to their correspondent, et cetera, et cetera. It doesn't happen like that. Um, many of you may be familiar with things like, if you've ever heard of Flywire, uh, they are a Boston-based peer-to-peer network. They do transactions. That's the kind of company I would go to to do this transaction. It's a peer-to-peer. -peer. They've taken out the banks, not exclusively, but they've made these transactions, created them with less friction, less intermediaries, and less cost, all right? Once... So when, when my transaction goes out to a blockchain, because I don't have a bank that says, okay, Lynn has the money, she can buy these shirts, the, the seller has the shirts, he can sell those shirts and they will be available on such and such a date. Because we don't have a bank as an intermediary, we have to put it out to the blockchain and the cryptographers, the miners, which we'll talk about in a minute, to verify those transactions. Those transactions get verified a minimum of six times. It is based on the mathematical equation of each transaction, my initial transaction request. Once it's verified by six miners, the transaction is combined with any other transactions. Maybe I, uh, you know, where the money originally came from. Um, you know, I may have sold something to get the cash to be able to buy the shirts. It's combined with all of those transactions sent to the uh, seller to verify I'm who I say I am. I have the money to buy those shirts. Um, all, of, all of the details of the transaction, just like a traditional contract, all right? The nice thing about this technology is now we have eliminated the banks and we have created a peer-to-peer -peer transaction. So I know that's a lot to digest, but we're gonna get deeper into this. So. When I look at the properties of blockchain or, you know, my preference is to call it distributed ledger technology, you know, I want to think about a few things. I, it's a shared distributed database, but there is no central authority. There's no bank, there's no registry of deeds, there's, you know, no Federal Reserve kind of in this world. <clears throat> um, but it is a way to really authenticate transactions and validate them. So the world that we live in today that we are coming from is a very centralized database. And most of you know this, right? Um, it's reconcilement. So if I wanna buy <clears throat> Valerie's car, all right? There's all these, you know, I have to, there's all this paperwork that goes involved. There's all this reconcilement, you know, taking money from my account, getting it to her account. At the end of the month, my bank sends me a statement to reconcile again. I paid her X for the car. All of those transactions are reconciled by my bank. All right. Um, it is a single point of failure and control. The bank says, uh, you know, we sent $5,000 to Valerie so Lynn could buy the car. Um, but there's a lot of unnecessary gateways and middlemen throughout this. Many banks currently do use cryptography, but it's kind of an afterthought. I mean, they do have a lot of other <clears throat> authentication mechanisms they use, but they have a very kludgy, if you've ever worked in a bank or financial institution, and even corporations understand this, the backup process for banking is really daunting. A lot of those systems, those uh, plumbing, as I call it, the back office, the databases are very old technology. So every night the bank updates their system and says, okay, you did this debit credit, blah, blah, here's your balance in your account. So that tomorrow morning they could publish to me, what's the cash in my account, et cetera. 
In a decentralized world, that doesn't exist. Each and all participants have their own identical copy. Changes are reflected in every copy. So if I sell my house to Valerie, Valerie says it's Itamara, I know I sold it with the refrigerator, with the curtains. Valerie cannot go in and say, nope, I never bought the refrigerator or it didn't have curtains. It, everybody can see that. Um, the records are stored in a chain, that's why it's called blockchain, in a continuous ledger. And there is, you know, most people say it is immutable, so it's unchangeable. It is relatively immutable, all right? There are some things um, that uh, we've seen that, that you can call them back. So one of the issues behind it is the callback of if I messed up, if I sent money that I shouldn't have, too much money or too little. Um, but we've seen with a lot of these uh, ransomware that they can find out who these people are. They can actually pull the money back. So it does have immu immutability, um, but it's somewhat relative. It's not final, I would say. The security is embedded in the encryption itself. And that's, that's really important because every single part of the transaction has this, um, has this encryption. In blockchain, there are two types. And I want you to think about this in the way that um, you, you exist today. So an unpermissioned or shared blockchain is over a decentralized database. It might be the, um, uh, it might be Boston Blockchain Association. It's an open source, all right? Anybody can go in there, access the information, they can look at it, et cetera. Um, when you talk about a permissioned database, that would be like your bank account. And in crypto or blockchain world, instead of having a bank account, you have a wallet address, very similar to your bank account. It is exclusive to you. You can have more than one, like you can have more than one bank account, but it is the way that I would transact business. So if you were going to pay me in blockchain world, right, in blockchain technology, you would use my wallet address, not my bank account, not my email address, but my wallet address. And we'll talk about those in a minute. Um, so permissioned is really a trusted participant. And it sounds, uh, it's probably closer aligned to what we're familiar with in traditional banking, okay? So how's everybody doing so far? Fast. <laughs> Did you have a question, Valerie? I will answer some questions at the end if you have some. No, so, I just, this has to really be irritating the IRS. I, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, we'll get to that in a minute. Um, so cryptography, which is really central to the blockchain technology, is a branch of math. And it creates mathematical proofs. I mean, just like we understand E equals MC squared, cryptography is telling us that to authenticate these transactions, it is possible in a mathematical equation. So <clears throat> all, you know, commerce and banking, uh, they're already using, a lot of banks already use cryptography, all right? But it isn't something that the, you know, retail, the consumer has been using. Well, now this is going to change it. This is how we will react to this new digital world that we're in. Um, so cryptography, it makes it possible for anybody to spend, um, uh, or, or impossible for anybody to spend funds from somebody else's wallet. Um, it encrypts the wallet. And as I said, your wallet is traditionally like your bank account. So it allows it to have the highest level that we know of at this point of security. So let's talk about blockchain for business. And this is a busy screen. So I'm gonna walk through some of it. <clears throat> um, you know, one of the things about blockchain for business is you can have both a, a permissioned, remember it's, it's controlled, it's more, uh, you know, secure and an unpermissioned. So <clears throat> let's say I own a store and I sell these shirts from Indonesia. Um, you, you could walk into my digital store and buy these. That might be an unpermissioned environment. Anybody can come in and buy my, my shirts. You can see them on my website, et cetera. But when we get into a permissioned environment, 
uh, let's say Pam wants to buy, you know, 500 of these shirts because she owns a store. Um, she might want to know, gee, you know, um, I'd like to buy these from Lynn. How do I know that she actually has the 500? Um, and I might say, gee, I don't know Pam. How do I know she has the money to buy these things, right? These shirts. So we would be using both unpermissioned and permissioned. And what might happen is Pam says, okay, Lynn, I'll give you a view into my private wallet, all right, for 10 seconds. So you can see that I could actually pay for those transactions. That might be something that happens in this world of blockchain. Um, the other part of blockchain that's really important is something called a smart contract. Now, you know, Bitcoin is not the only digital asset out there, as I'm sure many of you are aware. There are things like Ethereum, there's Litecoin, there's a many, there's over a thousand different cryptocurrencies. But one of the things that you want to be familiar with is this term of a smart contract. And it really is, <clears throat> when I think about a smart contract, the majority of smart contracts are written in the technology called Ethereum. Uh, and we'll get into, there's some books you can read about it. I'll tell you a little bit about that. But Ethereum is a type of blockchain that also has a digital asset associated with it. Ethereum came up with the idea that in business, I don't just need a currency to pay you. I need to know that Pam is going to buy 500 shirts from me, right? And they're a certain color and a certain size, et cetera. So a smart contract is written in the Ethereum code, and it has all the business terms embedded in the database to execute on that transaction. Pam is buying 500 shirts, they're color blue, they're size medium, and I'm going to deliver them on Thursday to her office, okay? Then I'm going to pay her, and I'm going to pay her in an Ethereum digital asset. Now, what I'm going to tell you right now is my personal opinion. But as I said, there are over a thousand digital assets, and we're going to talk about those in a minute. Most people think of Bitcoin as the, you know, sort of preferred digital asset, and I would agree. But when I look at Bitcoin, I personally believe that it is more of a store of value, like a property. So real estate, land, gold, assets you know, like a stock or something else. Those are things that I'm going to hold, and this is how I view Bitcoin, for future uh, appreciation versus some of the other digital assets which are used to transact business, okay? Ethereum, because of this smart contract, is extremely suitable to business because in that contract, I can say, I'm buying 500 shirts, they're blue, they're size medium, blah, blah, blah. And I'm paying you know, $5 a piece or whatever that price is. All of that is embedded, just like a traditional contract. You can't do that with Bitcoin, okay? You're not gonna sell your house to buy 500 shirts, okay? So I'm hoping that um, helps a little bit in this, uh, in this new world. Let's look at this technology and, and we're gonna, our next, step in this discussion is to talk about digital assets or cryptocurrency. So we walk through a blockchain transaction. I want to buy 500 shirts from Pam, all right? Or Pam wants to buy from me either one. Transaction is broadcast in a peer-to-peer -peer network. Uh, I don't know Pam, Pam doesn't know me. It goes out there in cryptography land. Um, these computers authenticate my transaction. They authenticate Pam has the assets to buy these shirts, let's say, and those are validated. Um, so a network of nodes, those nodes are the miners. They go out there in a mathematical equation and verify my transaction, Pam's transaction, all of the characteristics of the transaction and agree that that is in fact a valid transaction. All right, and, and it is authenticated in this world using algorithms, all right? So a verified transaction can involve cryptocurrency, but it would also, in a smart contract, involve 
all the records, all the information. Where is she going to deliver the shirts to? Where am I going to put send the money to? How much money per shirt? All of those contract characteristics are verified. That would create a block. That new block is added to the existing in a way that is immutable, permanent, and unalterable. That's a complete transaction. Now, if I want to pay in this new crypto land, all right, I, number one, have to have a wallet because that's how money gets transacted in this new world, very similar to a bank account. Pam also has to have her wallet. Within the contract, I say if those products are delivered to my doorstep on Thursday, blah, 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 I will, as part of the contract, ship or send X Ethereum to Pam's wallet. Okay, so I know that is challenging, but cryptocurrency becomes a medium of exchange, which is also stored electronically in the blockchain. So embedded in that is the actual, if this, then that. If this happens, it triggers the payment. It's not a step that I have to go through again and start this payment. It's part of the contract. So let's go to the next slide and we're gonna talk a little bit about what is money anyway? Because you know we're talking about Bitcoin, we're talking about Ethereum, there is Litecoin, there's altcoins. I mean, there's, as I said, over a thousand different cryptocurrencies. So money is traditionally a medium of exchange, whether that's eggs for pigs or you know seashells for, Pineapple, whatever that is, right? It's an exchange of value for goods and services. It is also a measure of value. So it's an accounting system, you know, that says, um, you know, this is how it's measured, right? So if you have five widgets, those are equal to X. If you have $5 or whatever, that is a measure of value. Um, a store of value is something that you can spend and store. And typically a store of value, which is sort of the way I look at Bitcoin, Bitcoin as a currency. I look at it more like a store of value and possibly a measure of value. It's something that I am gonna hold to, with the hope that it is going to create a better uh, appreciation, right? So that in the future, I will be able to buy more goods and services. Um, so there are three ways that money, as we know it, is used. I personally think of Bitcoin because it isn't as tradable or liquid, all right, as maybe some of the other currencies. I look at it more like a store of value, like a real estate property, land, a house, you know, something like that. Um, and maybe a measure of value more than a medium of exchange. I, with my Bitcoin, am not going to go out. I'm not going to use that every day to trade. I hold that I'm like I hold a house, right? In hopes that it appreciates. But money to be used every day really has to be like a medium of exchange. So we're going to talk a little bit about that and then miners. So the reason when you have money, and you have it in this new blockchain world, um, you don't have a central authority. So I don't have a bank that says, yep, Lynn, you deposited $5,000 in your bank account. That's because uh, Pam paid you for those shirts, right? That doesn't exist anymore. In a blockchain world, it's stored, everything is stored and verified in a network of computers. And so, to really verify that I'm who I say I am, that Pam, if she's uh, selling me these shirts, is who she says she is, and that we can trust each other, we need somebody to verify those transactions, right? Because if I said, oh, I got my whole family, they're going to verify those that I have $5,000 in my checking account. That, that's not valid, right? So Bitcoins are mined, and they are mined, and I should say really digital assets are mined. And it is a huge decentralized or peer-to-peer -peer network. And if uh, the one I mentioned is Flywire, there's, there's 
there's gobs of them out there. Um, a network of computers, which are constantly verifying and security, securing the accuracy of the blockchain data. Um, in exchange for doing that, miners earn some cryptocurrency. So it's sort of like a bank says, well, I'm gonna charge you, you know, $5 to do this transaction. Similar, but they get crypto. So every single Bitcoin transaction is reflected in the ledger with new information and put together in a block, which we talked about. Miners take up a lot of computing power because they have to verify in cryptography every single digit, all right, within the block. So they have to go through mathematically and verify whether it's an A or a number or whatever those characteristics are. They have to verify that. Um, so Blockchain is really the highway that the currency and the technology run on. So I equate it sometimes to sort of like a Tesla. If you own a Tesla, which I don't, but you know Tesla can drive 200 miles an hour. And obviously Elon Musk's uh, desire is to create the boring company, which will go underground from say LA to New York, I don't know how many couple, you know, few hours, right? Because you're driving at 200 miles an hour. Well, I can't take my Ford and drive 200 miles an hour. It doesn't work, <laughs> all right? So the highway that we're going to be driving on if we call it blockchain, all right? We have to now have new tools, new cars, new currency, new to be able to do business on this new highway. Um, so I, I don't know if that analogy works, but it kind of works for me because I think about, okay, I couldn't take my car underground 200 miles an hour. It doesn't go 200 miles an hour. The only way you can do that is either Tesla or, or if there's, you know, I'm sure there's some fancy car that, that drives 200 miles an hour, but your car doesn't work in this new technology. Your, your, your traditional financial instruments don't work in this technology. Now they're being built, they're being, you know, this is a nascent technology, it's being built. You see that company, these companies are springing up all over the place to do supply chain, trade finance, um, deeds on a blockchain. All of that is happening today, everywhere. It is everywhere. Um, so, you can't do one without the other, and you do need crypto, whatever you believe crypto to be. And, you know, before we get into sort of stable coins and central bank digital currency, um, you know, oftentimes people say, well, I, you know, this digital asset thing, this Bitcoin or Litecoin or Ether, I don't understand it. And I say, well, think about your credit card, because to me, a credit card is the first digital currency. And, and if you think about it, um, if you go to a bank and you say, I want to get a new credit card, and they say, okay, here's the new credit card. Lynn Marler's bank, here's your new credit card. And I'll give you $15,000 of credit on that card. That does not mean that I'm handing you $15,000. I'm not giving you $15,000. I'm saying that you can use up to $15,000. You can spend using that digital currency, that card, right? You can use that up to $15,000. That is essentially like a digital currency. I, you don't have $15,000 in your hand, right? You don't have it in your bank account. You don't own that. That's very similar to the world as I look at it for digital assets, all right? It is out there, it is stored out there. It's a value that you have. And it is probably, uh, or the way, you know, credit cards are my version of the first digital asset out there. Because really, you know, they don't, I don't have that, that cash, I, it's on a card. Now it's in a blockchain. So I don't know if that helps, but that, that sort of helps me sort of think about, well, where did this begin? And it really began, in my mind, with a lot of credit cards. That's really how this sort of idea um, started. 
if you can store value somewhere, you're storing value in the blockchain. Um, so let's talk about, I know we've been through a lot. This is fast. And as I said, this technology is fast. There's a lot out there. I'm going to tell you how to get education and how you can um, really go through uh, learning a little bit more about it. Because that's really the answer is you've got to start understanding it. I believe um, it is not going away. <laughs> uh, so let's talk about stable coins. Um, and, and you may have heard of things like uh, USDC, which is called US dollar coin. Uh, you may have heard of USDT, which is US dollar tether. So those are stable coins, are digital tokens that are backed one-to-one -one with a fiat currency. So let's think about this. So companies, so there are consortiums out there. This, when I started in 2018 down the blockchain rabbit hole, I worked for Bank of New York Mellon. Bank of New York Mellon was part of a consortium and started their own coin at the bank called BK Coin. And that coin, while it didn't really have a dollar to dollar value, the thought process was similar to a stable coin where at some point in Circle, you've probably heard of Circle, um, they're an exchange, all right? And they have, they own the largest amount of US dollar coin. It is a coin that is backed by the US dollar one to one. Behind that coin is what they believe are equivalent of US dollar transactions, whether those are government, money market, uh, repos, whatever is in those that they're holding in for those tokens, sort of like a mutual fund, is equivalent to one-to-one. -to -one. Or if you think about a money market account. So if you own a money market account and it says there is a you know one-to-one -one relationship between the US dollar and what they hold, well, what they hold might be stocks and bonds and whatever. Well, if Apple goes up or down today, remember they're trying to keep a stable value of one dollar. It's a very similar concept to a stable coin. Stable coin says, hey, and people like Circle say, hey, we are gonna make sure that every day, every moment, we're valuing these assets, these crypto assets behind us, equal to one to one to the US dollar. Now, stable coins are being touted all over the world. So it's not just um the us but remember stable coins really move with the fiat or country currency so their equivalent at usdc is equivalent to say one dollar or i put ten dollars here but one dollar of us dollar of the traditional us dollar the difference with central bank digital currencies. So while the stable coins say, we're gonna have this one-to-one -one relationship, they're not holding US dollars because US dollars are declining asset. The central banks, remember all the banks now, you've got all these countries all over the world seeing this rise of these currencies saying, I gotta, I gotta protect my own currency. I've gotta protect the federal reserve system. I've got to protect the value uh, that we've created through this monetary policy. <clears throat> Central bank digital currencies are really looking and they are trying to represent in a digital format, a new form of digital exchange and payment verification. They are being touted as the net, you know, you're not going to use US dollar, you're going to use a central bank digital currency. Well, if you read the initial 2008 white paper by Satoshi Nakamoto, who created this technology called blockchain and Bitcoin, the whole idea is not to be associated with a fiat or a country. So the central banks want to play in this space, they want to create their own digital currency, which is valued to the US dollar. All right, backed by the US dollar. Stable coins are not backed by the US dollar per se. 
they're backed by assets that they have chosen to equate to a US dollar. Um, so, you know, we're, we, we are just not, we are in the very beginning of these central bank digital currencies. And I think what we're gonna see is that they are going to be, you know, the, the discussion is not over and it's, um, it's gonna continue. So a little bit more on the US dollar coin. It was developed by uh, Circle and a consortium with Coinbase. Many of you have heard of Coinbase. It's probably one of the largest on and off ramps or exchanges in the marketplace. So you can take your US dollar from your bank account and move it to a Coinbase wallet, just right, so the new world. Um, the digital assets is backed by regulated financial institutions on a one-to-one, -one, it's redeemable one-to-one -one for a US dollar. Um, and we talk a little bit about Stellar, but you can trade US dollars just like on any other asset in the network. But remember, USDC is not managed, regulated, ruled by the central banks. Central bank digital currencies are. So there's a big, there's a big difference, right? USDC is managed by Circle at the moment. So just a quick, I'm gonna go through this very quickly. If you don't have a wallet in the blockchain world, um, you know, you that's how you trade or exchange your currency, whether it's US dollars or something else for some type of digital asset. Um, so cryptocurrency network assigns a unique address. And I said, that's your wallet address. If I was sending money to you, I need your wallet address to do that, uh, which is traditionally a private and public key. But then there is basically a password that's typically 12 unique words that are your private key. And in many cases, you need your private key to actually sign a transaction. If I was gonna send money to Pam to buy those shirts, um, she might wanna take a quick look or I might have to give her my private, I wouldn't give her my private key, but I would open up my wallet to let her see that I do have the money to buy that that uh, the shirts. Okay, um, so the way to manage cryptocurrency is through a wallet, and you know probably the most popular one. Coinbase has an I, um, you know, they did an IPO earlier this year. There are others like Kraken, uh, etc., um, that are in this space. Let me just see. Yeah. So you know there are businesses today that are using. Uh, we know Tesla, of course, but there are other businesses. Overstock uses uh, Bitcoin. You can pay with Bitcoin. Again, not my preferred because I'm looking at it like an appreciable asset. But um, <clears throat> there is a great um, article out there. If you want to read about how Overstock and what they say about Bitcoin, I'd go to this. Um, go to this. Uh, you can just Google this and you'll find out, you know, how are they using it? Um, it is being used for business. So you can buy a car, you can buy a Tesla. You know, I think you will see that you can be, you can buy, uh, you know, other things on it. It's going to be more popular, but it's a great article if your company is looking at, should we start, you know, a wallet, et cetera. Now, having said all of this, uh, there are no generally accepted accounting principles for cryptocurrency. Uh, Valerie, you talked about taxes. Um, today, at this moment, and it is, you know, state by state, there are different regulatory environments, um, and, and people are trying to change it like Wyoming, but uh, it is crypto, or let's use Bitcoin because it's easiest, is, um, is, is thought of as property. That means the minute I sell my crypto and exchange it into US dollars, that's a taxable event. So I'm not a tax attorney or, or tax lawyer um, you know, at all, but um, many people wanna be careful of that, right? So, so there are other ways around it. However, that is the, the law at the moment. One of the things to educate yourself that's really important is to follow some of the regulatory environment on crypto, especially if you're gonna be using it for a company on a balance sheet. You do have to know that there aren't a lot of rules yet. And one of the problems is that there isn't a callback. So if I mistakenly send Pam, I owe her 5,000, but I send her 50 and say, oops, today I'd go to my bank and I say, hey, I made a mistake. You see the contract, it said 5,000. I put an extra zero in there. Can we just you know, get the money from Pam, bring me back my $45,000? The bank would help me in that transaction. Doesn't exist anymore. 
<laughs> I'm on my own. Um, so I think that will change, but at the moment there isn't the regulation around that. So things to look, Internal Revenue Service, their commentary about it, Department of uh, you know, Financial Crimes, FinCEN, Commodities Futures Trading, Security and Exchange Board, you know, Financial Accounting Standards Board, Congress, state tax authorities. There's a great website that you can look at all these um, caucuses and find out what's happening. You know, <clears throat> there are some people that I also recommend you really, you know, watch for what they're saying. Obviously, Gary Gensler, who is the uh, chair of the SEC, has a lot to say. He was a professor at MIT. He taught blockchain and Bitcoin, so he knows about it. Um, I think people thought he was going to be a lot more friendly than he actually is, but in event. Um, other people, Hester Peirce, it's spelled P-E-I-R-C-E. -E. She is uh, quite involved in speaking about it. She doesn't, she's a commissioner. She hasn't made regulations, but she talks a lot about what she thinks should happen, which is quite interesting. People like Caitlin Long out of Wyoming, a former um, you know, Wall Street banker, moved to Wyoming. Wyoming is becoming the new Delaware where crypto <clears throat> uh, companies are uh, looking to incorporate. Uh, they have fairly uh, favorable rules around it. Um, <clears throat> there are many others, but that, that's just a start. There's some great books out there. Uh, Dan Topscott wrote a fabulous book about, called Blockchain Revolution. If you want to learn about Ethereum, <clears throat> uh, Camilla Russo wrote a book, uh, no, oh, The Infinite Machine about Ethereum, which is quite interesting. There's quite a few uh, new books out there, a lot of people to watch in the industry. Uh, <clears throat> So let me see, I think I have a couple. <clears throat> you know, this, this idea of decentralized finance or DeFi is being called blockchain 2.0, uh, where decentralized networks are changing financial products. So there are things out there, I know this gets a little more complicated, but when you start thinking about collateralizing loans, all right, lending, um, Bitcoin and these digital currencies or assets are being used as collateral, just like you might a house or stocks or whatever, to lend against, to create financial instruments. And those are in a decentralized world. Um, this is moving very rapidly. There's a lot of what are called dApps, decentralized applications that are being built for this. They're all over the place. You can find them uh, <clears throat> all over the place. So here's some key terms. I'm not gonna walk through all of them, but <clears throat> Uh, this is some of the uh, terms around this um, that might help you understand it. And I, I can make this presentation available if people want it. Um, <clears throat> and uh, we're not going to get into the private blockchain, but um, that's really that's really it. Um, there's my website. Uh, not my website. I'm sorry. There's my email on Boston Blockchain. Um, and there's my Gmail. I'd be happy to open it up. Uh, I'm going to stop sharing. I'd be happy to open it up to some questions if you have some. <clears throat> I know that was fast. So I know you're like, whoa. <laughs> so yeah, was, I, would, I would really was, say get educated, start learning about it and trying to understand it. So I see there's some questions here. <clears throat> yes, Zachary Littman um, asked, have you experienced or seen any nightmares where people have lost their wallet passports, <laughs> passwords with crypto holdings in them? Absolutely. Yeah. So here's the thing, you know, there are um, <clears throat> different types of wallets out there, uh, hot wallets and cold wallets. And depending on how many, you know, how much value you have, I would definitely recommend having a cold wallet, right? So you're storing it off of, say, a Coinbase. Well, you know, there's, you know, you could call me, I could tell you a little bit more about it. But yes, there was a gentleman, I think he was in the United Kingdom, who had a computer and he had um, all his crypto was on his, all his passwords were on the computer. And for some reason, the computer got thrown away. And he paid somebody $70,000 to go through the trash to find, find that computer. They never found it. So <clears throat> there are only 21 million Bitcoin available. That's it. So it's not like the US dollar, we can just keep printing this stuff. That doesn't happen. So <clears throat> there are, they suspect that there are really about 18 million that are actually out available in circulation totally. Now, at least 13 or maybe more have, have been mined and are being, you know, are being held somewhere. 
So there, they said at 18 million is probably the real available because the rest of them to 21 are lost or gone and they will probably never be found. So like that computer, the guy, if you never find the passwords and the keys, you're never gonna find it. So it's a, um, it's a very interesting world. I would recommend that you do have, uh, you know, there's a lot of banks now getting into crypto custody. And I'd highly recommend either that or having your own cold wallet because, uh, you know, in my mind, nothing is unhackable. Uh, this is probably the closest, but, you know, the banks are a step away. I mean, they're one step ahead of the hackers. So, um, but in many cases in a bank, you have insurance, you have FDI insurance up to $250,000. Doesn't exist in this world. So, you know, <clears throat> anything else? Lynn, I'm, 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 as I'm hearing to, I mean, this was obviously very interesting and, uh, a lot to think about. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but um, it sounds to me like Venmo is doing the job. Yes. In other words, you have your, your assets in, in a bank or whatever, and then you use Venmo for P2P, and it's simple, it's trackable, you get somebody to talk to. Why take the risk of using something that you won't be able to talk to somebody if there's an issue? Yeah, well, I, I do think Venmo is a very good example. It's a peer-to-peer -peer transaction network, but I don't know what the dollar limits are on Venmo. But the other part of it is, you know, if I, again, I'll use my shirt example. If I wanted to buy 500 shirts from you, I mean, in you know, and I'm running a business and I have to keep the tax, all the data of when did I buy the shirts, how much did I pay for the shirts, how much was the shipping and all of those taxable things. Um <clears throat> you know, I can't really do that on Venmo. I kind of need a smart contract. So Venmo is great for, um, you know, if I, I, I want to tip you or I want to uh, you know, buy a small doll, I don't know what the doll, maybe it is even up to, I think it's up to 10,000. But remember, once, when you get in the real banking financial world, $10,000 deposit creates what's called a SARS report, a suspicious activity report. And that means that, you know, it gets scrutiny. Where did you get your money to be able to buy $10,000 worth of stuff? Doesn't happen in blockchain world. Okay, so there's there's none of that. So Venmo's great, but I wouldn't be buying, you know, I don't know, a $10,000 boat from you or something. I, I wouldn't do it. But at the same time, right now, this crypto uh, is in infancy. And you know that the governments of the world will put their hands on it. They're not going to allow it to continue to be like a free for all. Right. So, 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 so the regulations are going to be there. And you might get yourself to, in a sense situation yeah. where you have to report everything that's more than 10, equivalent to $10,000 anyway. <laughs> Well, you, you, Itamar, you are right. In fact, you know, I get a lot of the financial institutions coming to me saying, you know, if I am going to on or off ramp any type of crypto or digital asset, what are my responsibilities? Do I have to create a SARS report because somebody deposited $10,000 worth of Bitcoin, even though maybe I'm using another, a third party, a private label behind me to hold those assets, you know, I'm going to take them, you know, essentially they're coming in Lynn Marler's bank and I might store them at a custody bank, not on my balance sheet, but they pass through me. And my responsibility is like in a bank, the, you know, uh, the bank of first deposit, I got to do a SARS report. Is that going to happen? My answer is inevitably, yes. Is it today? No. So, you know, the, the cautionary tale is that, you know, everybody said, well, this is a nefarious actor's game. Well, when they actually studied it, 2% of all transactions are nefarious. And I will tell you that probably in 2018, much more of these transactions, they were drug dealers, they were arms dealers, and they were making fortunes off of this. That is not true now, all right? There is, there is a verification process that we've gotten a lot smarter about it, um, but, um, it is, I, I, you are absolutely right. And, you know, you look at China, all right, they've cracked down on all the exchanges, they've cracked down right. on, you know, trading, on mining, on all of this stuff. That doesn't mean the Chinese aren't holding Bitcoin, because they are. Um, 
I do believe you're you're right that and I do believe we need rules because there aren't any. So, you know, how, you know, I mean, we need rules. Um, but how much is, is part of the question? You know, how much regulatory environment do we need? I think the thing that most people are concerned about, at least me personally, I can say for myself, uh, you know, it concerns me that the US dollar is being devalued every second. It concerns me that we're, we have this debt ceiling that just keeps growing and growing and growing. So all we're doing is printing an asset that is getting devalued all the time. How do I protect myself and my children in the future? Mm -hmm. And so I look at this like I'm going to own a home, right? And that I could pass on to my kids. Or I'm going to own some Bitcoin or a currency in the hopes that that passes on, that I can pass that asset on, um, you know. So, I mean, those are, yeah, go ahead. Uh, and, and, and tomorrow, this is partly for you too. This is Scott Hokinson, um, was invited by Lisa Fosdick. So I, I, I'm labeled as Lisa right now, but uh, <laughs> um, I, I had a handful of real estate transactions this year. One of them was on a Friday before a holiday and my bank held the money until the next Monday. Yeah. You know what I mean? You know, and so, <laughs> hundreds of thousands of dollars that I'm waiting to pay contractors and I get the check on a Friday from an attorney and my local bank that knows me very well didn't let me have access to the money until next Monday. If I could have taken Bitcoin, I would have. Now, yeah, I'm not thank you very yet. much. We, we invested yeah. your money over the week. Thank you very much for that. Yeah. You know, so, so in my, I'm curious if, you know, Rock and Trust and mm -hmm. the Eastern of the world realize that that's what's going to push guys like me to, I'll take I'll take Bitcoin, Ethereum, Cardano tomorrow, uh, in exchange for the houses I flipped. Yeah. Um, if somebody offered to pay me in in Bitcoin, I would have taken it because uh, I'm confident. I'm a bit aggressive and what have you. But um, I bet there's going to be more people like me. That once again, there's a reason why it took ten days for them to give me the money or whatever, you know. But I've been a bank bank client of them for ten years. And it still took, you know, from Friday to two Mondays later before I was able to pay off the contractors, which was frustrating. Well, and I, you, I just you have a really good point because yeah. the fact of the matter is, is, and remember, your U.S. dollar to U.S. dollar, you take that transaction and put a foreign exchange in front of that. All right, the worst, you know, if you want to call it friction, if you want to call yeah. it, you know, there is no transparency in foreign exchange transactions. If that was a foreign currency coming in. You'd be, you know, there's typically two day spot transaction that like hardly ever happens, right? Because it's from one bank to another bank to another bank all along the way, they're all taking a cha-ching. So if I owed you $5,000, by the time you get it, it might be $4,500, yeah. right? Every single person, every bank is touching that. And, you know, this network of banks who all have the opportunity to fail, whether it's liquidity, operational, negligent, you know, could be a variety of things. Um, so, I mean, when you think about the friction that's involved, the, um, you know, those are the problems that people are trying to solve with this technology, not just, but when you look at the currency and you look at places like Argentina, Lebanon, I have family in Lebanon. I mean, they had money in the bank. It's been devalued so much by the central government, you know, they can't even get food. They can't pay for food. I mean, it happened in Africa, you know, it's happening around the world. Um, that isn't to say that at some point it won't happen to Bitcoin. I mean, there's only a certain amount that's that's available. However, um, and the re I don't mean that it's going to, you know, the banks or the, the federal, the, the fiat governments, yes, they're going to put the rules around it. But because it isn't related to a fiat, you can't just print it. And so for me, it creates some stabilization, even though it's a, you know, it's a very volatile asset at the moment. But you nailed it. And, you know, you there are peer to peer networks that would help you out like like and I'm not plugging Flywire. It's just that I know them. So uh, but there are many like them that will do a peer to peer transaction, um, you know, internationally, right? They do it internationally, right? They do it internationally. Yeah. And I mean, there's there's companies like Ninth Year. They do it internationally. They're they're all over the place. They do it in a blockchain environment. So Flywire, yes. You know, another really good example right here in Boston is Toast. I don't know if any of you have heard of Toast, but 
So if you want to go to a restaurant, and again, I don't, I don't, I'm not plugging these guys. I just know about them. And, you know, they've created this technology. So what happens is you can order, let's say you're going to a Celtics game, but you want to have dinner at your favorite restaurant in the North End. You say, oh my God, traffic's really bad. Can you have, here's what I want to order. Can you have that ready at 6.05 so I can quickly eat and get to the game? They'll have your food, food ready because they know you're going to arrive at 6.05. You sit down, you eat what you ordered. There's no delay time, right? Sit down, eat what you ordered. When you finish, you say, okay, um, on toast, they send you a QR code that says, okay, you had lasagna and somebody else said whatever, you know, it's $52.60 and you wanna pay Apple Pay or do you wanna pay your credit card? I don't take a credit card out of my wallet. I just go, here's my QR code with my payment. Thank you very much. There's your tip, see ya, I'm out of there. That's toast. And I originally heard them a few years ago and I thought, oh, I don't get it. This is not gonna... But I have been seeing this at restaurants and I'll tell you, it is amazing. It has cut out. I don't have to deal, not deal, but I'm not waiting for that waitress to go take my credit card. You know, she's taking it, which frightens me, right? God knows she could copy whatever. She takes it, comes back. I sign with the tip, blah, 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 blah. She's got to come back with the piece of paper. You know, it's just, those steps are all gone, gone. So that's also a peer-to-peer -peer network, all right? It has the, the payment right on it, payment rails tied into all the food, everything. And I mean, you know, think about the, the slippage that happens in a restaurant with either, you know, people stealing credit card numbers or, you know, the, the tips that are there and how, you know, there's a lot of stuff that happens um, in, in different industries. So we are just, as I said, at the beginning of this journey. And I think... Um, Every day, I'm just amazed at some of the technology. So, Lynn, how would someone get started if they <clears throat> just getting into Bitcoin? So I talked a little bit about a wallet. You know, there's several out there. I mean, personally, I started with Coinbase a long time ago in 2018. So I'm not plugging Coinbase, but you can look at, you know, what's an alternative to Coinbase. Um, you, you basically, um, Itamar, I think you talked about Venmo, just like Venmo. You marry, you take your traditional bank account, right? So you go and open a Coinbase account um, and you set up a public and a private key. So public key is like the address, your wallet address. Your private key is like these 12 words that you better not forget or lose because that's how you'll get your money. And if there's ever a problem, you need those. But you set up a, a just like Venmo, you set it up in Coinbase and you take money, US dollars from your bank account and move it into say Coinbase or another exchange. There's Kraken out there. There's, oh my God, Binance, Bittrex. There's a slew of them. Um, and then those exchanges will say, okay, Lynn, now you got 500 bucks US dollar equivalent. What do you want to buy? You want to buy Bitcoin? You want to buy Ether? You want to buy Litecoin? You want to buy you know, Dogecoin? I mean- you name it. So that that's the way to do it. <clears throat> Lynn, I got a question for you. Yeah. Isn't part, I know Itamar brought up Venmo, isn't part of the intrigue for businesses to use blockchain? And for example, you brought up a company buying shirts overseas. And I know a big problem for manufacturing and, and goods and services is counterfeiting. Isn't the blockchain able to, you know, verify where this is throughout the whole process and then hopefully eliminate some of the counterfeiting of goods that happen? Exactly. You bring up a really good point, you know, because I mean, I've been to China like 25 times uh, for business and, you know, the, the counterfeit market, I mean, you can go to a market and buy, you know, all counterfeit goods, but at the front of the market, it says, we don't sell counterfeit goods. And you walk in there and you know, everything's counterfeit, like, okay, sure. Um, <clears throat> but yes. Now <clears throat> I'll tell you this though. Um, the, 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 it is possible in a very controlled environment. So let me give you an example. And, and you, you nailed it. And that's part of what this technology can solve. So think about the pharma industry. <clears throat> if I'm a pharmaceutical company and I say, hey, I'm manufacturing here, uh, whatever that drug is, you know, uh, whatever that pharma is, it might be an opiate, it might be, you know, um, uh, Valium, it might be COVID or whatever. I authenticate that, listen, this was made in my facility 
at this location at this time, and it's this batch number, and there are 500 batches of whatever. All right, think about that in a blockchain technology. So, you know, the most fraudulent prescription, of course, is, um, um, yeah, now I'm going to forget the name, the blue pill, <laughs> Viagra, okay? That's counterfeited all over the place. So you can buy it, but you don't know what's in it. Um, if, if, if I'm manufacturing something like that, I am giving you the authentic, this is from my lab, I'm an authorized lab, these are the contents, everything is verifiable. That in the pharma world, <clears throat> there are companies that are doing this today. Um, and, you know, it's to me, that is a perfect way that I want to see. I don't want a counterfeit drug. I don't whether I don't care if it's a nasal spray or an aspirin. Right. I want to know it was manufactured safely. Right. With 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 all the requirements for, um, you know, the FDA or whatever. That's easy to do. When you know when you think about counterfeit goods and and um, you know let, let's whether they're clothing or Gucci shoes or purses or whatever, you know. Well, so my brother was involved in manufacturing uh, for a large company in in the middle uh, in China Asia, and you know what happens in that world happens less now, but you know if I worked and I make you know two dollars a day to feed my family. All right. And, and, you know, a lot of the Asians before this enormous rise, because I've been going to China for 25 years, but it's a good example because it really shows what happened. You know, those people have had two cultural revolutions. They make two dollars. They were making two dollars a week. All right. If I have the opportunity to say, hey, Itamar and Valerie, we're working on the factory line and we can take these Gucci shoes and sell them you know, in Hong Kong, yes, we're going to take chances, but for a hundred US or, uh, you know, the yuan or a currency, right? I mean, that changes my life, right? From a hundred dollars to share between three people, whether it's, you know, $33 each of us, we're making $2 a week or maybe $2 a day, $33 a day, uh, $33 for one transaction to take a risk. I'm probably going to do it. So there's a lot of slippage that happens that, and maybe those Gucci shoes, you know, weren't perfect, right? So they were imperfect in some way and they're going to be thrown out. I just take them and I sell them. Will you ever, you know, so yes, at some point it will be that, you know, the Gucci and all that will, will have, and, and, you know, some of them have in it, this card that says this is authentic, but the slippage that happens within some, almost like a, um, you know, if you've got collusion, none of this works, right? So in a, an environment like that, which really has happened a lot in China, um, and I'm not bashing China, you know, I, I have a Chinese daughter, but, but the fact of the matter is, you know, when you put it in the context of the risk that they're taking to do that, why wouldn't they sell a fraudulent item, all right? Uh, steal an item that's going to be thrown away anyway and be able to make some money on it, potentially, or just agree, we're going to steal it. You take one shoe, I take the other, and we're going to sell them because we're going to pay for food for a month. So that has changed a lot. I mean, there's a lot of wealthy people in China now, but that was the reality. So I think to actually get, you know, to be able to counterfeit goods, to really, really track them is not going to be that simple because you, is it possible? Yes. But it's, we're not quite there yet. I do think it's going to happen. So every shoe will have a QR code or something on it that says manufactured at Lin's Gucci factory in Shenzhen on such and such a date. It's going to have that on there. And, you know, totally verified that there are no imperfections in this, or whatever it says, and put in a box. Yes, it is going to happen. Uh, are we there yet? No. And, and it's a little bit harder when you have an environment that isn't as controllable as sort of a pharma, if that, if that makes sense. So hopefully I answered your question. <laughs> Thank you. Good job. Well, Lynn, I think we, could, we could listen to you all day long here. <laughs> uh, and you know what? You don't want to because I, you know, my husband was like, don't, I don't want to hear another thing about <laughs> <laughs> 
you're the only people I can talk to. So it's great. <laughs> Lynn, um, thank you so much. So I talk about this every week, almost every day. And I am, as I say, down the rabbit hole, but I will leave you with only one thought. And yeah, sure, join Boston Blockchain. Go get educated because it is the only, you got to start understanding this. Uh, it is a train that's coming. And, you know, if you look at how is wealth created in the United States, wealth is traditionally created by home ownership, right? Mm -hmm. This is a whole new world. Wealth will be created by these cryptocurrencies. If you don't get in now, you see the Goldman Sachs, the JP Morgan, you know, Jamie Dimon says he doesn't like it. He, they are very heavily invested in it for their high net worth clients. Every single high net worth bank that I know and an advisor, family office, are running to this world. You need to be aware of what's going on. I don't mean to be like, you should be doing this, but I really do. That, that's my mission is to really say, go get educated, make your own decisions. You, may, you might not agree with me. Mm -hmm. That's okay, but know, what, know this stuff. You gotta know this stuff. And I'll tell you, it changes every second. So you really gotta stay on it. But that would be my message to you is just get the education because it's coming. Um, Thank you, Lynn. Thank you very much. Liz. Yeah, Thank happy you. to answer any questions. I love them because I learn. So, um, you know, I, every day I learn about this technology. Um, and if you want to, if you want to know about some, there's some great YouTubes out there or whatever, just, um, you know, email me and I'll give you a list of things that are really good. Lynn, I, I have something for you. Me, sure. me and I are actually on the board of our business development committee at Citroen. And we'd love to kind of have you come in and talk to the groups. I might talk, reach out to you offline and kind of, I love it. And, you know, it's, you know, my goal is to really, really, um, I, I, I really want to understand this more than I do now. And I know you guys probably think, well, she's ahead of the curve. I have been studying this for a long time and, you know, I go in waves, but I am, I, I just, I think this technology uh, has, you know, we only touched on financial. I mean, think about your digital identity. Think about the unbanked, all right? I know plenty of people who come from other countries here. They own property somewhere that's worth a lot of money. They can't get a bank account in the United States. They can get one in an internet world, right? But a traditional bank account, they can't get because they don't have, you know, assets or they don't have a valid address. They may be, you know... Uh, they have to like own a property, you know, the banks have all these rules. So it has the ability to, you know, think about a digital identity. I come from, you know, I'm half Polish. I come from Poland and I say, you know what, my family owns, you know, half of the, you know, such and such area. Well, that's valuable, right? That's an asset. And mm -hmm. somebody, whether it's Sterling Bank or somebody else, Starling Bank, sorry, out of the UK, which is an internet bank, they would look at that as an asset. But today, a lot of US banks don't. So identity, your, you know, think about your health records. The only state in the nation that owns where you own your health records is New Hampshire. Your healthcare company owns your health records. Mm -hmm. And by the way, if you spit in the vial for 23andMe, 23andMe made $300 million off of your spit. <laughs> Put that in perspective, right? So, you know, why should they? Shouldn't, shouldn't my DNA, my genomic data, it's mine. If, 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 if it's gonna be sold, shouldn't I get something for it? Or at least agree that, now what most people don't know is that they actually did agree that it could be sold when they, um, you know, spit in the vial for the 23andMe. So all I'm saying is the world is changing and it is uh, what I believe in this technology is that everything that you know, we know, and we've grown up with certainly my generation uh, is going to be almost eradicated. Not completely, but I mean, it's going to be a really fast moving transition. So. Yeah. Thank you, Lynn. Now try to go to work. Yes. <laughs> Be productive. Yeah. So reach out to me. I'm happy to speak. I'm happy to, um, you know, if anybody wants any more information, happy to do that. So just let me know. Lynn, thank you so much. Thank, thank you, you so much. Bye, hey, I want to talk to Rockland Trust. I know. I know. <laughs>
<laughs> Thanks, everyone. Be safe. And um, thank you for the opportunity. Appreciate it. Thank bye -bye. you. Yeah, bye -bye. Thank you.